welcome to this is the fifth episode, fourth and a half episode, however you guys want to think of it, episode of the Board Game Mechanics. And we're going to do a short form show between our long ones. This is our inaugural episode. I'm Joel and with me is... Hey, it's Jason. Hey, and I got a microphone that's hooked up correctly and a better microphone, so we should sound better than last time. Yeah, I think the last episode, if you listen to it, was worth the pain of the bad audio because I think it was a pretty good episode overall. Yeah, I agree. So thanks, thanks for listening, I guess. Um, those of you who did, um, we haven't had anybody post the secret phrase yet for the highest of fives yet. I don't think on the Facebook page. So no, I haven't seen I, it. I don't know what to think of that. Any anyway, um, I'm just going to start off with this. I guess I'm, we have show notes, and Jason, I'm going to do an audible here again. So All Omaha, right. that'll be my last episode. So like I like sung the praises of WizKids being this amazing company that's putting out Euro games now, and like a potential pushback against Asmodee owning everything. Well, Asmodee owns WizKids, it looks like, or does something with WizKids. So that's a bummer, I guess. Yeah, it is. Anyway. Anyway. Um, so moving on. Uh, this episode, I think we're just going to do a short form, like I said. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit of some news and Kickstarter stuff. But then we're going to get right into what we played at, uh, at our meetup. We had a little meetup this last weekend. A lot of fun. Played some really fun games, so I'm really excited to get to that. We're going to call so, this uh, BGM Con 2. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have like six of them this year. So <laughs> <laughs> that podcast that does six cons a year. Yep. So anyway, I'm going to jump right into some of this Kickstarter stuff so we can get to the BGM Con 2 stuff. Some of this Kickstarter stuff so we can get to the BGM Con 2 stuff. Um, right off the bat... Um, AEG has a big Kickstarter they're pushing right now. I don't know if you've seen this one or not, Jason, but it's called, um, I think it's called Edge of Darkness. It's a big box. It reminds me a little bit of just some of the epic games that the other companies are putting out. Um, but the thing that's kind of cool about it, I was ready to totally write it off because it has this weird dice tower thing. And so like, I think an episode we're going to do in the future is going to be about gimmicks in gaming. So immediately I was like, oh, this is so gimmicky. It has this big dice tower for like how initiatives figured out for the bad guys or whatever. And I was like, forget it. I'm not going to back that. And I was actually getting ready to be like, this is just showing how gimmicky fake Kickstarters can be. But as I looked into it a little more, it actually is going to use that Mystic Veil like um, system of card crafting. So it kind of looks maybe a little cool. I don't know. We'll see. So Edge of Darkness, that's one that I think is worth mentioning. Yeah, um, I looked into that one a little bit. The trans, I think, is worth mentioning. Yeah, um, I looked into that one a little bit. I thought Mystic Fail seems cool, and I still haven't played that yet, but the the mechanic is kind of neat. Yeah, for sure. The transparent cards that you stack on top of each other to make better cards is kind of cool. Um, I've never played Mystic Veil at all. Like, I haven't even demoed it. But I'm like, do you put the cards in sleeves or how does that work? Like, how do you keep the different layers together? Yeah, Jim and Kim have it. I think the cards go in sleeves. So you just like pile them on top of each other in the sleeve. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. It's one that I think is cool. And if I saw it at like a Cool Stuff Inc. clearance or something for like under 20 bucks or something, I'd definitely jump at it. But um, I don't know. There's just enough other games out there that you just can't do everything. So. Yeah, I agree. Anyway. Um. Legacy's Lend, Ion's Lend Legacy. I want to talk about that too because it's just like another Legacy game coming out, and this Legacy game coming out, and this one to me, like I'm going to be a little negative about this one. This one's so super funded, and it's definitely going to go. Um, and it's in indie boards and cards, which I usually like their stuff, but this is their like attempt at doing a Legacy game, I think. And so it's like le- the kind of cool idea that you're doing an RPG type Legacy thing where you're powering up characters and telling a story. But to me, the whole system seems like it would just play so much better as a video game. So, I mean, like, that's kind of, I don't know, my take on that one. Um, And then the last one I want to talk about, I actually want to hold off because I want to let you talk about what you need to talk about first. Because I think I want to talk to you a little more back and forth on the last one I have to bring here. So, Jason... I guess we have some exciting news about this, this, the channel and stuff here. Yeah, it is pretty exciting. Um, the company Jelly Bean Games reached out to us, and they wanted us to do a review for their upcoming Kickstarter called Village Pillage. Um, they sent over a pre-production of the rules, and person to your right and the person to your left. And you're trying to either steal turnips from them, because turnips is the money in the game, which is kind of cool. And <laughs> you're trying to collect turnips to buy relics. 
and the first person to buy three relics wins. So it seems like a pretty quick light game where you're stealing turns from people, you're trying to gather turns from your supply to your vault so they don't get stolen. Um, simple game. It has really cool card artwork as well. So I'm kind of pumped to get that and check it out. Yeah, uh, it's neat. I, the company, um, Jelly Bean Games, it, they make very much like lighter kids games, it seems. So I, I don't know. This might seem like they're going into something a little different here with this game, like trying to maybe hook more gamers in by doing a Kickstarter and reaching out to one of the premier gaming uh, board gaming podcasts out there, the board game <laughs> mechanics. So Yeah, that's true. They knew where to go first. That's right. I mean, most people would be like Vassal, Dice Tower, whatever. But no, they know. They know where the new voice, where the kids are listening nowadays. I, I like, no, they know. They know where the new voice, where the kids are listening nowadays. That's true. That is true. So yeah, that, that game should be showing up within the next uh, week or so, and then we'll get some stuff posted as soon as possible. That sounds really cool. I hope it's good. I, I like. I really hope it's good because, I don't know, just selfishly, I want us to be able to do a positive review for... Our inaugural review. Right. So yeah, I agree. I agree with you 100%. In the 50 reviews that I did with my son, we only did one really negative review. And it felt so bad. I still think about it sometimes. So hopefully it's positive and we can do something good with that game. I mean, honestly, there's always something positive you can find about it. So, I mean, we'll just look at it that way. Yeah. Now, like, are we connected to these guys at all? Or did they just like find us through social media and stuff? Yeah. Um, they were posted on some... I think some Facebook group and I sent them a message and then they, they reached back out to us. So it was pretty cool. Huh. That is pretty cool. Huh. That is cool. They were pretty quick to respond. Now I don't have a message. I, I'm going to check actually. I'm going to click over. Yeah. I don't have a message back from these guys yet, but um, the last one I want to talk about is one that like, it's a Kickstarter that I've not heard much about and you might have, but um, it's a reprint of Endeavor. And now it's called Endeavor Age of Sale. So I think they might have added some stuff to it. And it's not Z-Man doing it this time. So Endeavor was a game that came out, like, I don't know, maybe five years ago. And it wasn't super popular. I remember seeing it around. I remember mostly thinking, hey, that box looks cool. It looks like a like messenger bag. Um, but this game looks actually like it's really up your alley. And it looks like it's kind of up my alley, too. Um, so this is one that I'm remarkably close to backing. I just... Uh, I don't know. I haven't quite pulled the trigger on it yet. I think I might look into a little more what Endeavor was like the first game. Um, but in this game, you're basically like sailing around the world and collecting goods and kind of goods and kind of getting bounty from bounty from uh, or booty, I guess, from uh, different like. I don't think you're playing as a pirate. You're playing more as like a settler or explorer. So you're getting things though by like I don't know befriending or whatever different colonies, and then um, basically. Uh, from there that you can build buildings into your tableau and have like different buildings that do different things for you. And you're trying to open up trade routes to try and, you know, open up other continents to trade with. And it's, so it's got like area control elements to it. It's got like a light sieve building thing to it almost with it. Um, it looks, I mean, really honestly, when I was looking at it, I was like, Oh man, this has got these huge player mats and then like abstract cubes and chips on a board. And, uh, the theme is trading. I was like, this is totally Jason's kind of game. And I, I think it looks pretty good myself, too. I don't know. Have you seen it at all? Yeah, I looked at it on Kickstarter because I watched a review of the old game, the original. Uh -huh. I, think, I think Ryan Messler did it or something. Don't talk about it. You know, the normal Euro stuff. But I was interested in this, but I just it might might break my uh, my threshold of money that I'd like to spend on the game. I th yeah. I think it's like 64 bucks is what it is. So Jason's got a rule we don't talk about much. The rule of don't spend more than 50 bucks on a game, which I think has been a good rule for you, probably. Yeah, I think I've only broken it a couple times, and I try not to. Well, if the game is 64 bucks in Kickstarter, then in retail it'll be like 41 I mean, like, that's just <laughs> yeah, how it that's works. True. I mean, it is. And that's why, like, I mean, Rising Sun, people are paying a lot of money for it and have it right now. But I'm pretty sure that that game will be widely available in June, and it'll be on Amazon for 55 bucks. And I mean, like, I don't know that I'll ever get it even, but I mean, I have that fear of messing out that FOMO thing right now, but I don't know. It'll go away. And, uh, it's kind of, I kind of wanted the same thing about this. Like, can I, it is a kiss. Like, can I just wait until it's in retail? I don't know. Maybe. So 
Yeah. I, that's the only one that's really got me. Like the other one is the Batman Kickstarter, and the only reason why I'm pretty like ah uh, about that one is it looks pretty awesome, and it is a Kickstarter exclusive. So I, I guess Kickstarter exclusive. If I'm going to be honest, what that really means to me is it means um, we're going to say that you can only get this on Kickstarter, and then we won't put it out for like four or five months after the Kickstarters are backed. Back uh, the backers get their games. And then we'll put it out in distribution because, like, I don't know that I've ever seen anything be 100% Kickstarter exclusive, honestly. Seventh Continent's trying to do that, I think. I know. Uh, but even then, like, they can, say it's, they can say it's Kickstarter exclusive. That's fine. But, like, they have late pledge managers that go between their Kickstarter campaigns. So, yeah, like, if you true. wanted to buy Seventh Continent right now, you could go out and get one, like, order one, and then it would ship to you. Like, order one, and then it would ship to you. Like when the rest of the backers get their copies, and I'm gonna tell you, I've thought about it, but I don't know. Part of me thinks just get a good choose your own adventure book and play Carcassonne at the same time. Like I think that <laughs> may be your comment that you made about the game anyway. So. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, the only game that's interesting to me on Kickstarter right now is Finca. Yeah, I really thought about backing that, but man, it's like sixty one dollars or something, and I can't do it. It's not that interesting to me because I own it, but if I did own it, I would be all over it. It is interesting to me because that game right now, like my copy of Finca is like not sought after, but it's a little bit rare. Right. And like the copy they're putting out on Kickstarter is so much nicer than the one I'm going to have. Like it's going to have wooden donkey carts instead of cardboard discs. And it's going to have like extra expansions that I don't have. And the board might be bigger and all kinds of stuff. So Isn't the windmill like nice tiles too? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, uh, there's extra tiles that come with it. it. Like, there's, like, a rainbow tile and just some other stuff like that. So it's not worth me spending 61 bucks on for a game for a game that I think is good. Like, it's an it's an eight, maybe a six, but it's definitely it's definitely a, a good six or maybe a little bit of a weak eight. So if I had a normal human rating system, I would call that a seven. But right. I, I refuse to do all, all the numbers. So it's between a six and an eight, but it's not a seven. <laughs> um, but, I mean, like, that game, like... I don't know if if uh, if it had just a little more to it, I think I would really like it. As is, if I have two two, if I have two, if I have a choice between it and Cinque Terre, I'm gonna pick Cinque Terre because I just think I don't know. I'm not a huge Rondell guy. Like I think you like Rondells more than I do. Yeah, I, I do um, like a good Rondell. So you might like Finca better than Cinque Terre, honestly. But I don't know. I, it's it's good, but I don't think it's sixty one dollars good. And if they can get it fully kickstarted, like that one would be one that would be forty bucks retail probably. Yeah, so, you're probably right. I think it was really dr- video. I guess we call it. We kind of meet up halfway at uh, at a at a gaming location between our two places, and um, we had a pretty good day of gaming. It actually, I'm gonna be honest. It kind of to a degree felt like the day started really slow. Like it felt like. The first couple of games we got done were like just really drawn out. Not the first one, but like the middle section. It just felt like everything was really drawn out. Yeah. It's like, man, we aren't going to get many plays of games in. I agree. But yeah. we ended up getting a fair amount of games in by the time it was all said and done. Yeah, because we flew through two games when somebody was still playing through one that shouldn't have even taken that long. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And yeah, like they were playing Raiders of the North, right? North Sea. Yeah. Or whatever that game's called. And that's, I mean, it's not like a like filler or anything, but I mean, that's a game that if you have people who know what they're doing, I think it, you can play that in an hour pretty easily. Yeah, um, I agree. And we played what, Jason? Well, my first game, Mombasa. Oh, I finally got to play that game in all of its gloriousness. Like it. I finally got to play that game in all of its gloriousness. And it, in the fact that you even remotely liked it tells me that it's an excellent game because I've hyped this game up so high. Oh, I didn't just like it. I mean... It's like a must buy. If I can find that game within my price threshold, I will snatch that up immediately. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a really fun game. I really like it. Um, and I think you like your definition of heavy and my definition of heavy are a little different. Like I call it medium heavy for me, but for you, it's solidly medium. I think, yeah, it was it was medium all the way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but yeah, um, you only... beat me on your first play, so you did pretty well in that. I did. St. Louis all the way. <laughs> I mean, I, we only played it two players, so I don't have any. I can't talk about three and four, but man, I would play that game two players all day. That was it, it was fast. It, it was plays nice. really well with two. Yeah, it was awesome. Actually, that was the first time I played it with two players, and I loved it at two. It played so fast. Did it too. It played so fast. Um, three is really good too, and I mean, if people want to play it at four, I would. 
But I would, man, I, I love that game at two and I love it at three. And it was so fun playing with you at two because you, you and I are both pretty, we're both kind of intuition guys. And I think our intuition does well for us most of the time when we play games. Right. But we both kind of go, man, my gut just tells me this is the way I need to go. Like we don't sit there and math out things. So the guy who maths out things, like when he's playing Power Grid, he gets out graph paper and a uh, calculator. Like right. that guy's no fun to play with. <laughs> so yeah. it was a but, good experience. Actually, my favorite part of the game was the playing cards in front of you. And then when you played it, you had to move it up to the same row on top. Right. I don't know, that was super thinky because then you're like, man, I don't want to put the Explorer here because then I'm going to have a pile of 14 Explorer cards. I need right. to get some resources to buy some cards. Yeah, that was that was the thinkiest part of the game, and it was awesome. I think I told you the same thing uh, on Saturday when we played. That like my brain just naturally like likes to organize cards, so like the bananas sit next to each other in a row, <laughs> right, and then like right. you know whatever. Yeah. But like it doesn't help you to do that because if you do that, then you end up with like so like I always put like my best card, then my then my ba- like my second best card of the same suit as that like bananas or exp- exploration, and then I put right. like my outlier card in the third row, and like if I keep doing that throughout the whole game, then I have this one stack of just amazing cards that I take back, and then the other two are pretty pitiful. So. That ends up burning me sometimes. Yeah. The, yeah. the other thing, too, is like you have to balance not only that, you have to balance everything in that game. So I worked super hard to open up all five card slots and didn't buy a lot of cards. Um, so I did a ton with the diamond track and did a ton with the bookkeeping. And, and then just I didn't buy cards as fast as I should or as many cards as I should. So then when I finally got all five of them opened, like I found myself at times having five cards in my hand, but they were cards like, a one cotton, a one banana, a bookkeeper, another bookkeeper, and like a one exploration. And I was like, right. okay, I guess I'll put all these down, but like, I wish I had better cut all these down, but like, I wish I had better cards for these five slots that I did open. So, yeah, I didn't even open my fifth slot until the second to last round. I just kept yeah. buying up all the shares of cards for St. Louis and just put all my stock in St. Louis. The guy, well, the guy that scored over or near 200 points when I played against him. He didn't, never opened his fifth slot. He just totally ignored the bookkeeping track, like completely ignored it. And I think that maybe the best way to play this game is to really actually focus on something. And trying to play a balanced game hasn't ever worked for me yet. So, I don't know. There's a yeah. pro tip for you guys. I mean, I could see you being able to do a balanced game, but it's just way easier to focus on one thing and move. It's one of those games, too, where you have to have like a sneaky, like, I'm going to do this in the last round thing figured out. And for me, it was going to be the red track, the, uh, I don't remember what that one's called. The one that, like, I don't know, the red, the red track at the bottom there. Yeah, like, I don't remember uh, what it is either. I, I don't know, the red, the red track at the bottom there. Yeah, like, I don't remember uh, what it is either. I, I was really going to try, and, like, it was only two coins less than St. Louis, which was the one that you cashed in on like crazy. Yeah. I was I was gonna try my very best in the last round, move a couple of those huts out to make the value of the stock higher, and then move myself up on that track a ton, and like kind of hope you didn't notice that I was doing that, and it just didn't <laughs> work out for me. Yeah, I don't I don't know so. if because if, what I was noticing when we were playing two players is there was pretty much two tracks that were just getting ignored. Yeah, oh, I absolutely. I don't know if it's like that in higher player counts, but yeah, I, I could care less. Orange, I don't even think moved one time. And we, yeah, we literally didn't move a house out of there, yeah. a little hut out of there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, that, I think it probably is pretty weird. I think if you and I were better players, maybe we would have done something different. Maybe. Um, but I mean, even then, the board got pretty crowded with just us using two and a half or two and a quarter factions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. half or two and a quarter factions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, like, I don't know. It's got that worker placement stuff in there, too, that you were talking about, feeling like it's a little tacked on. I feel like the bookkeeping's a little tacked on, but yeah. I don't know, man. It's That game's solidly an 8 for me. It's not quite a 10, but it's solidly an 8. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. It's not even as heavy as I like it. I would play that game all the time. Yeah. Now, the next one you got to get going is uh, Great Western Trail, which, I mean, like, it's totally different. I mean, that that's why Alexander Feaster, like, got got put on my list for like one of my favorite designers his games are all just so different and good so next time we'll have to play great western at the end of this we'll have to talk about games we didn't get to play that we want to play so i'll right. save that for later well anyway the game i didn't get to play this one with you unfortunately um but i did get a chance to play ennis with a couple guys who had never played it before and um that was really a fun experience 
Those guys were both fairly competitive, honestly. Um, fairly competitive, honestly. Um, I, I, I'm going to, he gets mentioned on this show all the time and I know he doesn't listen to this show, so we can talk bad about him all we want, but Jed was there again. (laughs) And like that dude, man, like he's not even AP prone. He, well, he is AP, but he's more like, I don't pay attention to when it's my turn kind of thing. And so like he makes games a lot longer sometimes it feels like. Um, but on Ennis, like he was pretty on it because we were always handing him cards. The only thing that got kind of annoying is my brother Matt and I are both quick intuition type players like you are too. Right. And so like we would pass like on Ennis, you pass three cards and you pass two cards and you pass one card. So like there were times when Jed would have a stack of three cards and a stack of two cards in front of him while he was picking cards. <laughs> like, and I mean, you've definitely seen that in seven wonders too, where like right. somebody has, you know, like two decks of cards that they have to pick from while everyone else is waiting on them. Yeah. So, but I mean, that's such a fun game too. I mean, like it's as mean a game as I think you'd ever want to play, but I think you'd enjoy it too. Okay. <laughs> no, it's 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 a card game, and the dudes on the map kind of represents what's going on with the cards. I okay. don't know. It's both. It's definitely both. It has a card drafting thing, like Seven Wonders. I mean, like it's now called the Seven Wonders right, right, right. mechanic that, like you know, drawing cards, pass them on thing. Um, which actually came from games before that, like Fairy Tale did it before Seven Wonders. But yeah. Seven Wonders is the one who popularized it, I guess. Um, so it has that mechanic, and like the main set of cards is um, is basically like these green action cards, and they all let you do something slightly different, like put a sanctuary down on the map, or let you do the different kinds of actions. And then there's these like uh, epic tales cards which are really powerful cards and you can slowly get those by using those green cards. And then when you have a majority in any of those like kind of triangle shaped tiles, you get another card that you put in your hand. It's like an extra little bonus too. So that you put in your hand, it's like an extra little bonus too. So, um, it's, it's a pretty cool game in how like you draft these cards and then you do like, you know, you take turns playing down a card, doing an action and you can temper your turns like in dogs of war or whatever, where you, you pass and then you can jump back in. You can pass, but there's always a risk when you pass of everyone else passing too on that turn. And then it goes to the next round. So if you have some good cards in your hand and you want to like wait and see what other people are going to do, you can definitely say pass, which is a big part of the game. Um, but it's just always a risk. So I don't know. It's uh, it's definitely a, like the card play is huge in it, but then the people on the map is pretty important too. The thing about Ennis that is pretty, pretty, um, it's actually, I think pronounced Inish. But the thing about it that is really unique is it has this pretender token that you take, which is like basically you say, you know what, I have one of the victory conditions right now, and you guys have to the end of this round to make me not have this victory condition or else I'm going to win the game. This round to make me not have this victory condition or else I'm going to win the game. So it's not like you just instantly win the game after you get this victory condition. Like you have to call your shot kind of. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of interesting thing about it. The other one too is like you can get these these deeds, these little like harp looking tokens too. So like the victory condition can be like be the chieftain over six different uh, like opposing clansmen. Well, if you get one of those deeds, then it's only five. If you have two of those deeds, it's only four. So it's like a wild card almost, which is something that you don't normally see in the dudes on a map game. So it's it's pretty cool as far as dudes on a map. It has just some uniqueness to it. It's not your standard. I'm gonna push into this place and then we're gonna do some kind of constructed combat against each other it's more like hey do you want to coexist in this land that's another interesting part too is if you don't want to fight you don't have to like you can just coexist in the same territory so i don't know it has a lot of different weird stuff going on like that yeah i'm interested in it i just you're the only person i think i know that has it and i was the only person i think i know that has it and i was playing something else so (laughs) yeah well i think that box the box makes it look like I mean, I know the art is renowned and it's a style, mm-hmm. but the style I don't think goes over well with people. Like the style of the actual box art, like the actual, it looks kind of primitive almost or something, but I know it's intentionally that way. Right. So I know that the box art put people off for a long time. And I know that I, I, I really, really, there's like three reviewers that if their like opinion of a game lines up, then I know I'm going to love it. And these guys, all three were like, this is the best game I played all year. And so I, even with them, like giving it such a glowing review, I, it took me a long time to get it because I was just like, I don't know. And, uh, so I did finally get it and I'm happy I did. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I like the way the board fits together. That's pretty neat. Oh, for sure. Looks like little leaves or something. 
What? Uh, yeah, it's and then like the little joke about in a couple episodes, and you finally got to play it with me, and that's Dinosaur Island. And you should be raving about it. It's really good. <laughs> it is really good. You're right. Um, so yeah, we played a three player game of Dinosaur Island. That's my first time playing more than two. And man, it's just as good at three. It, every player count of that game plays exactly the same way. It's fast. Yeah. It does an outstay. It's welcome. It's amazing. We had a good group for it. I mean, there were three of us, but I think that the three of us playing were all like pretty quick players. So it felt like it moved really well. Right. Yeah. That yeah. was kind of the theme of when I was ever, whenever I played with you, I feel like we played pretty quick. Yeah, because I want to get as many games in as possible. So I don't, even if like I wanted to think about something, I'd probably just make a decision and go. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> so yeah, um, I don't remember who won that. It might have been me. Might have been you. It wasn't Kim. I know that. Yeah, I think I it was know. you that won. I think you beat me by like nine. I think it was you that won. I think you beat me by like nine points. Um, oh yeah, because you had a dinosaur tank that didn't have any dinosaurs in it. Yeah, I'll always remember that. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's a really good game. I think it's just, it's like clockwork. I think that description of it, where everything just fits together so well, is a really accurate way to talk about it. I think really the way to think about it is there's the four phases in the game. I feel like each of those phases is almost like a little mini game. And then yeah. each mini game impacts the next one. You know what I mean? And so they flow together incredibly smoothly. Um, But it has four very distinct kind of phases. It has like a purchasing phase. It has like a, I don't know, I guess a worker placement phase. It has another second like worker placement phase, but solitary worker placement phase in your own little like created empire. And then it has like a tile placement kind of maximizing your own little civilization again phase. Yeah. Civilization again phase. Yeah. And like I was telling you, it it seems like it's... um a medium weight game packaged in a heavyweight package. Cause when you explain it, it doesn't take that long to explain. It's hey, this is phase one, do this, phase two, do this, phase three, do this, this is phase four. Then we do it over and over and over. Yeah, yeah totally. Well, I think the fact that it is those phases and they're kinda exist on their own makes it a kinda easy game to explain. Uh I, I you did you did a nice job of explaining it though, and it felt like I knew what I was doing from the very beginning. Yeah, I forgot to mention the whole make sure you have a dinosaur in your your um pen thing, but outside of that it was all right. If that's the worst you did, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> I mean like, I don't know. I've ha- I've played games where people are like, "Oh, wait, there's this critical rule that happens in round 3 where we have to sacrifice every card or something, you know, and then it's like, <laughs> right. but I was waiting up for round, waiting up for round 4 where I was going to make my big move, you know? I mean, so that little kind of oversight isn't a huge deal to me. Right. So what, I'll tell you what, though. The thing that I love about this game is the uh, the components on it are really good. I mean, those agreed. player boards were nice. Um, the like little other boards were really good. The plastic dinosaurs, the plastic bag of meeples, all of it's not like overly like ex- uh, exorbitantly done, but it's done well enough that it's like you're going to have a good lasting component there that you're happy to play with, and they kept the price below a hundred bucks. You know. And right. the component I really thought was awesome were those dye. Like those like dye that look like a piece of like ember almost or amber yeah. or whatever. Amber, those yeah. Those are really cool. Um and like I seriously wish they did have a mosquito inside the in, inside the middle of them. That's yeah. a that's an upgrade kit, you know, <laughs> later on or something. I don't know. But So what do you cool. think about the ending? Did you think the ending just kind of snuck up on you? Um I think I saw where I knew I was gonna try and get our in conditions were like you had to have, you know, three of those cards satisfied right. and i knew that one got satisfied really early and then a second one happened maybe a couple rounds later and then you guys were both flirting with the third one and i knew that i was going to try and push hard when i got the dna there to get the fourth one which was have a threat level of 15 in your park so i knew that if you guys didn't get it i was going to get that third one and i was pretty positive you guys were going to get that third one in that round too so i kind of foresaw it coming but I could definitely see where it could definitely catch you by surprise that you're just like, build, 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 build. And then you're like, wait a minute. I didn't even notice that this guy had this condition ready to go, <laughs> right. plus this other one. And then like you might have the third one. And so it could definitely sneak up on you pretty quick for sure. Yeah, that's um, literally my only flaw with that game is that I, I don't particularly love that, but it is what it is. 
We played the medium game, and that felt right to me, by the way. We played the medium game, and that felt right to me, by the way. Like, I don't think I would have been happy playing the short game. Like, the right. short game just feels like it would just be done before it even got wound up. Tutorial. The long game I might try. Um, I might be interested to play the long game just based on the fact that I think two more rounds probably would have been really good for me. Mm-hmm. But that said, like, the park the park in my laboratory was completely full almost by the end of the game. So right. on the medium game. So I think the medium game is probably the sweet spot. Yeah. I've only played medium and yeah, I, I like the medium a lot. I tried the, I want to try the long game at least once just so I can see some of the new goal cards and stuff. But outside of that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty neat. I like that game a lot. Like I, I would give that one in, between an eight and a 10, but not a nine because I don't, ex- I don't believe in nines. <laughs> So <laughs> you like pop, you like even numbers. Yeah, I do. I, I think that's one that like I I will definitely when I when I find it on sale or even when I find it on sale or even in like online pricing or even if my local guy gets it and gives me I get like kind of a special secret he likes me discount. So um even even if that happens I will get it when it comes out. Um but I'm not going to pay like the extra high third market prices right now right for it but it's it's definitely i'll be happy to play your copy anytime too yeah i found like, it at a game store it was 80 bucks with 20 percent off i got that game for 64 dollars. you broke your rule i broke my rule but i had to on this one yeah i um i think i'll probably end up doing something similar so i i did uh i did tell my local guy that i would buy a copy of empires of the void too if he brought it brought it in Right. So that's my next big game I'm going to get. But anyway, that's we don't have time for that. We need to go start talking about the next game that we played. <laughs> Which this one, I'm I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. Um, 50 reviews. This is another WizKids game that came out that's a Euro game. And they've been doing so well with your Euro games that I thought, you know what, I'm going to blind buy this one. There are like literally 50 reviews of this game online. No videos on it. The only video out there, as far as I know, on this game thing now is is one that I put out, um, and I think you edited it up a little bit and made it look a little better. But um, like that's the only video that exists of Empires is the name of the game, and it's a game that on the box says it plays from two to ten players, and it doesn't have a range of times. It says it's just going to take you sixty minutes to play, and I kind of believe it, yeah. um, because the the actions all happen pretty simultaneously. Um, I'm, I'm conflicted on how I feel about this game at this point. I think it's one that is absolutely, you play the players, not the game. And it's one that the gamers are going to make the game, honestly. Right. So if you have the right group of 10 people, I think this game would be probably one of the most remarkable and fun experiences that you'd ever play. It's okay. Every little <laughs> thing, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. I think in our group of six people who played it, I think probably three of us thought it was okay to at least having some potential. And I think two probably were like, it's okay. And I think one person just didn't like it. Um, And I mean, like, I think that's probably what you'd find. But this game basically is as simple a I'm running an empire type game as you're ever going to find. Like, it doesn't even have a map for saying that I am owning these territories. Like, when you get territories, they're just little chits that you get. They say territory. Right. And they all look the same. And... uh it's it's the most euro version of a war game you'll ever find because everything's completely abstracted and put into machine terms. So that's why that's why I think you kind of like it maybe a little. Oh, um, I did like it. Yeah, I actually did really like it. I was did into you? it. Yeah. Um, and my friend Jed said it was his favorite game he played all night. And so, I mean, like, I don't know. There's definitely some potential for it to be good. So, I mean, like, I don't know. There's definitely some potential for it to be good. But it has this weird thing of, like, you produce goods from your territories but then when you have extra goods laying around, you have to have people consume those goods as luxuries. And then that produces support for you and your empire. So, I mean, like, it's kind of an interesting balancing thing because if you don't have people left over to make more goods, then you can't sell goods in the market, but you did get victory points. So it's like, but then if you do have goods that you produced, you can try and sell them for coins to win wars, or you can hang on to your goods to get more victory points. So there's some interesting choices built into it just mechanically. And then the thing that we didn't really get into much because we're all learning the game, but really where the game I think plays is everything's open trading. You can trade anything. I mean, you could trade anything for anything in that game. So I could say, you know, Hey, I'll take all of your nasty revolt cards. If you promise me that you won't, you know, buy any goods this round. 
And you could say, yeah, sure. I take all your revolt cards. Then I'll any goods this round. And you could say, yeah, sure. I take all your revolt cards. Then all of a sudden you put out three things. So there's no binding on it. But I mean, like, yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's just a total backstabby negotiation auction game. And then like you do have wars. But like I think the term wars is used pretty loosely on it because they're really not wars. They're just auctions. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, so, um, I I liked it. I I kind of wish it went on a little longer, honestly. Yeah. And I, I wish the market I didn't that. seem broken. The market piece is the piece I didn't care for. Yeah, and I think I figured it out later. Like, that market is made to be broken. Like, that's a part of the negotiation things that they're trying right, to drive. Right. Is that, I mean, like, what you're talking about is there's only, like, in a six-player game, there really is only about eight slots of market before the market's totally flooded and goods are worth zero. Right. So there's like this market mechanic of like if very few people sell goods, if a, I mean like what you're talking about is there's only like in a six player game, there really is only about eight slots of market before the market's totally flooded and goods are worth zero. Right. So there's like this market mechanic of like if very few people sell goods, the goods are going to be worth a lot of money. Like they could be worth as much as 10, 10 gold or more. Even I think if only like one or two people sold one good, in a really big game. Right. But if a bunch of people sell goods at one time, it gets down to zero quick. And so the first time we discovered this was like kind of on accident. I was like, man, I really want to win a war. And so I'm going to sell five goods this round. And I had the five goods to do it because I had a bunch of extra people from the round before. And um, so I put five goods out and uh, everyone else did like one or two. Well, that was like a total of like 11 goods, which is way too many. Like, I think we would have had like negative two as the price on the goods if the track went into negatives. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I think mean, like so. it, bot- it bottoms out at zero. But so I, I did that the first round. And then we all talked about this is just the kind of gamer that Jet is. Like, we need to have Jet. Right. So right. we all need to make sure we're using it sparingly because if not, we're all going to get hosed and get no money out of it. <laughs> right. And so we all like acknowledge that. And we're like, yeah, that's really weird how that works. Because I think mine was honestly an accident. Like, I didn't think through entirely, like, how bad it would be to sell five goods. Right, so, right. So then, so then the next round, like, Jed drops a five totally on purpose <laughs> and just laughs about it. Like, and everyone yeah. else is doing ones and twos. <laughs> I think probably actually was just ones. And nobody got any money again. So, like, yeah, yeah he that was kind of a way of doing king making a little bit that he did there a little bit. So whoever didn't right. sell their goods got a bunch of support cards the next round. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's got a bunch of really interesting things that could, if you get, this is another one of those games that if you get this game and your game group doesn't get together real often or isn't willing to play a game several times, I wouldn't suggest it. I think it's one of those games that you almost have to play it every week or every couple of weeks for three, four months. So that way you guys can really get a feel. For, so that way you guys can really get a feel for the game and get good at it and understand how different scenarios might play out. And then I think it would be a really fun game. But I think just playing it one or two times over the course of a year, it's going to be pretty difficult to get it to play. It, it'll be the real test of time on this thing, or the real test of this thing, I think, will be at Origins and at Gen Con. If right. people are there playing it, like that might be a good sign because it seems like a convention game almost because it can play 10 players. So Yeah, I can see that. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I'm interested I, that you liked it as much as you did. Yeah, I was surprised too. When you opened the box, I saw all those pieces. Like, this is a negotiation game. I know it. And it yeah. was. Oh, yeah, but, you knew right away. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah, I enjoyed it. I mostly liked phase one and phase three the best because the war was essentially, hey, I'm claiming this tile. <laughs> right. I like that. But yeah, I'd play it. It totally was sure. an auction. Right. But I think it's fun too. Like, this is something to know about that game is that we had six people playing in the game, is that we had six people playing. And I was reading the rules, which are terrible, by the way. So watch my video where I try and explain the game a little bit instead right. of what, reading the rules because they're just not very good. Um, but like five people were punching cardboard <laughs> while I read the rules. And it seriously took five people like five to ten minutes each to punch this whole game out because it just yeah. has so many little chits in it. Like it, was it has an inch of punch boards and everything's just full in those punch boards. So there's yep. a ton in it, but it's, it's a pretty simple game for what it is too. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, so while you were while you Go were ahead. playing while you were playing Inish, I was playing Dragon's Gate College. Yeah, which looks really good, except for one thing. What What do you think the one thing that I like just based on appearances? I was like, what What is that? I have no idea. <laughs> so I think what it was 
that made me go, what is that? Is that the player boards look like you like went to an inkjet printer? Like you left the player boards at home? Oh, like, yeah. Let me get us some pieces of paper and print some more player boards because it looks like that. <laughs> you, you did say that. They make Terraforming Mars player boards look amazing. Yeah, They do. I That's mean, like, true. seriously. Yeah. It wasn't even like shiny paper. It was just on like <laughs> cardstock. Right. But I mean, this game is pretty fun. Essentially, it's a dice drafting game, but you don't really ever draft the dice. You just take a die. You guys, were playing, you guys looked all looked intense when you were playing it, yeah, especially because- at the end. Yeah, it, it is kind of intense because you only have six rounds. So you're trying to be as efficient as possible, recruit some students, recruit some teachers. You know, you're trying to get as much money as you can because you got to build buildings. And it's one of those games where if you can't fill up your entire board, you lose points with tiles. So you're trying to make hmm. sure that you have enough tiles on your board so you don't lose points. But yeah, it's super fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. And it's, again, it's one of those games that looks like it's a, a heavyweight game, but it's really probably light medium. Played out. Like, yeah, kind of. Kind of. I mean, yeah. is that is that part of how it works? Like, do you move through the track, or like it looked like it just had a track that you guys were moving through? Yeah, there's one track. It's like the Chamber of Secrets in Harry Potter. That's what it mm-hmm. should be called if it was a Harry Potter game. But yeah, based on the number of die, the number of pips on the die you take, you can move one, two, or three spaces. But that's that's the only roll and move piece of it. And even then, you're not rolling. It's just based on the number you take. Yeah. Um. It it looked like something I would have been okay playing. Um, I don't know. Do you? Where do you rate it at? Was that your first time playing it? Yeah, I, yeah, I got it a couple of weeks ago. Um, I this was is a recent of, Kickstarter like fulfillment. I don't know. I think it came out at Essen, and then it just now came to America. Oh, gotcha. So um, yeah, I'd probably rate it. I like it. I'd play it any time, probably. So maybe from uh, I'll do the normal rating. So probably a seven. Mm, between six and eight. Mm. Mm, between six and eight yeah gotcha. between six and eight yeah <laughs> so between six and eight i'll own sometimes but it's more like i would love to play other people's copy of it um and eight is a game that i'm probably going to own most of the time unless everybody i know owns it so huh yeah so I, that's, I actually think you would like this one a little bit it, yeah. it's pretty fun yeah it isn't it doesn't look bad it looks like it has some iconography that you have to learn a little bit but it doesn't look too bad yeah so. uh one thing we noticed was th- there were two different times when icons that looked exactly the same meant two different things. Hmm. So that was one issue that they probably could have done a little differently. But outside of that, yeah, it was pretty self-explanatory. Did it have some strange in-game scoring stuff too? Because it seems like people were kind of like complaining about, wait, what? That's worth points or whatever kind of at the end. (laughs) Yeah, that roll and move track that you keep calling it. um, We didn't really understand how to score that. So I just made a call that I thought is what it meant. And then some people who were in is what it meant. And then some people who were in the track ended up getting more points than people who went all the way through the track. And that didn't seem right. So, Oh, huh. Okay. It looked, it looked like it was a fun enough game, though. I mean, it looks like they weren't... It looked like they were trying to get the feel and the flavor of Harry Potter. But it didn't look like they were trying to make like a Harry Potter game without paying for the license. So I, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty Harry Potter-ish. I mean... Yeah, if you would have looked at it closer, it would have been a lot more Harry Potterish. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's it's pretty Harry Potterish. Like they just didn't want to pay for the license, right? Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Huh. Well, the last game we played for the night actually was we got out um, Steve Jackson's uh, a Steve Jackson game, and this is one that we teased a little bit on the Facebook page. But this is Revolution by Philip DeBerry, and this game got I think. I think it played. Yeah. We played oh, yeah. it with five, which actually six, didn't we? It was six. Yeah. We, yeah, we played it with six and it felt like it played pretty well. And it's because so much of that happens simultaneously that it right. didn't really bog the game down too much. Yeah. I think, I think that's one of those games that no matter what the player count is, it's going to take the exact amount of time. Right. And that's the thing about empires. We didn't really mention that much. Like most of your actions happen in that simultaneously as well. So, I think right. both those games, like with six, it might take slightly longer because you're doing a little more like, you know, checking to see who won the auctions and stuff. But I think it doesn't scale up like 25 minutes per player like most games do, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So this is one that I had a really good time playing. We didn't play with like bid refunds, which is a popular variant. 
Uh, we played the nasty, mean version, and that makes the game feel so much more tight, and it makes you it think really so does. much harder when you're bidding, because yeah. you are like, I don't, I don't want to lose stuff for nothing. I could have put one coin on that and won and gotten the force <laughs> and something else. Yeah. If I'd have known. And then the other one is like the feeling of, oh my gosh, I put one force on that and someone else put two force on it, you know? Like <laughs> I just lost out like this powerful, you know, bid I made. Right. Um, Jed, stupid Jed, we're going to keep <laughs> trashing him. He won this game with a kind of weird strategy. Like it's definitely a viable strategy. Yeah. There's just a. Good a there's a spot on the board where you don't really influence any. I guess you do influence like the plantation or something, maybe. But the printer, like, the, the printer doesn't put any cubes out. Is that? That's what I was thinking. There's yeah. there's one spot where you get six points for just going there, and you get to put a cube out. And then there's another one where like you just get ten points. <laughs> and he kept putting so many coins on those and getting so much. And this yeah. is where I love your wife too. She is hilarious. <laughs> like she, like she didn't care if she won or not anymore. She just had this like. It's not even like social justice. It is social. I think right? I just had this like. It's not even like social justice. It is social justice thing, <laughs> but it's social justice over the stupidest stuff, and that's why I love it. Like she's like, I am not gonna let him get this printer spot again. So like she would figure out how to get like the highest currency in the game and put it on that spot every turn, <laughs> just so he couldn't get it. And yeah. like that was really funny to me too. She ended up getting second though because she was doing that. I think right, <laughs> right. And I think I think uh, his name is I think Jim, right? The other guy that yeah, was Jim. there. Yeah. Yeah. He he would have done really well too, except for um I think the last round or so, he had area majority on like two spots and he ended up losing both those spots. Or else right, he would yeah. I think run away with it. So I don't know. Those printer points, those ten points every turn that you can't really take from someone by like switching cubes out. Is really powerful though, and I don't think any of us thought it was as powerful as we did until much later in the game. And so he got a bunch of free points, and that's how he won. Go with us. And so he got a bunch of free points, and that's how he won. Yeah, I, like this game to me, like I hated this game and I loved it at the same time. Like every turn, yeah, I was just so sure. ticked off because people kept going where I wanted to go with a stupid force, and all I could get was stupid gold coins, and. I couldn't yeah. do anything because I couldn't beat anybody. <laughs> it was so irritating. I mean, like, if you hate a game that much, it must mean something good because it means, like, you cared enough. It means that you cared enough that you, like, were invested in it to make you mad, you know? And that means it's probably a good game. Right. So, well, this yeah. is one that, like, you immediately were like, yeah, I'm looking at trying to find a secondhand copy of this game. So, I mean, like, you liked it that much at least, I think. So. Yeah, it was amazing. And I actually, like, I found a copy of it for 20 bucks. I'm still trying to get it. And then I wanted to get the, yeah. um, you, yeah, because you have the Palace expansion, right? For five or six do. players. Yeah, I wanted to get the, um, pris- or if you get, basically, instead of the Palace, it's like a jail. Huh. So you can put, you, you can put people in jail. And then if they have the majority in there, they lose like 40 points. What? <laughs> yes. That's it's awesome. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So here's what I wonder. If you get the two six player expansions, like that it takes it from a four player to a six player game, can you stack those and play an eight player game of Revolution? Like that'd be amazing. That would be awesome. I don't, I don't know, know if there's I, enough spots in that little auction board for it to. Anarchy comes though. with white and black cubes. What did the palace come with? The palace came with, I think, like purple and yellow or something like that. Game, it's a real. I don't think white. I don't think white and black are in, are in my game. So. I don't know. That'd be interesting. I'm sure that on Board Game Geek, there's already somebody who made a variant of it where you play eight yeah, players. I'm sure. That would be awesome. I, if it does and it plays even remotely decently, like I would have a hard time thinking of a better eight-player game. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Because it's, a, it's so this, a real game. It's not just a party game. It's a real game. Right. And this is one, too. Like Philip DeBerry, we love. We sing his praises in here all the time. But like this poor guy... I think he was selling games out of his trunk, and and Steve Jackson Games was the first one to be like, "Hey, we'll publish your game." And of course, like if I was selling my little prototype that I'm working on right now, if Steve Jackson Games came to me and said, "Hey, we want to try and do a, you know, like worker placement game, like your kind of game, so we want to develop it and publish it," I would say, "Yeah, absolutely." I'd jump right. in. I'd jump in with Steve Jackson Games right away too if I was an unknown. But then the problem is like now this game is better. I don't want to say it's better. We're done by like Z Man or somebody. Like, it would have been a much better fit, and I think it would be a much more popular game. I just I wonder how many people have walked by this game and not bought it, because the 
first words in the box are Steve Jackson games right. and big hitters. Like it says Steve Jackson games on it, almost as big as it says the name of the game on the front. The thing, like I was at, what was it? Maybe last year. I was at Origins last year and there was a Steve Jackson booth. And the, literally the only game that was not being bought from that booth, Munchkin was selling out like crazy. Revolution and both expansions were sitting right there the whole entire week. No one was yeah, buying any of it. It's just totally different than what they do. Yeah, it's crazy. The other game that is Philip DeBerry's that is kind of feels similar is um, Courtier. But I mean, like, it's area control. It's really similar, like how you're putting cubes on areas to, to claim points. Right. But instead of it being a mean auction thing, it's more of a drawing cards and collecting cards Apollo. well for you to do it instead of, you know, winning auctions. So you might like that game even better, but that's one of the many games that we didn't get a chance to play over the last weekend. And so I right. guess that kind of puts us into our, like, our, like, kind of wrap up here of um, what were the games that we didn't get to play that we wish we could have? Um, I wanted to play Marco Polo with you. I did too. Because I think you'd really dig that because it's different than some of the other games I think you played. For sure. I, I mean, like, I've heard so many good things about it and I still haven't played it. It's definitely one that I want to try out. And every time I see it at the board game shop, I'm like, do I blind buy this? I know I'll be happy to own it and be happy that I own it. But right. that's going to... So, like, remember Marco Polo when we mentioned uh, our our next episode coming up? Because it might, <laughs> might make that list. That's a big hint. <laughs> right. But anyway... Yeah, that's one that I wish we could have played. Transatlantic, I know you learned the rules for that one. And that's one yeah. that, like, I thought if we're going to get to play a Matt Gertz game, like, it's going to be Transatlantic this weekend. But we didn't get a chance to break that one out. So that was kind of a bummer. Yeah, I do want to play that. Venus, we didn't get to play Venus either, which I know oh. that's one that you're absolutely going to love when we do get a yes. chance to play it. Um, yes. But we just didn't get a chance for it either. There's never enough time to play all the games that you want to play. That's true. I think I think Clans of Caledon- Caledonia was in the box too. Or was oh, in yeah. Kim's Kim, bag, and we didn't even Kim get a chance to break it out. And like, actually, that kind of hit me the next day. I was like, man, I could have played Clans and figured out what all that's about, and we didn't get a chance to do that even. Yeah, that so, game's hard to find too, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's on my like, it's on my like, I guess I'd call it temporary grail list right now of games that I just think. I'm I'm so tempted by it that I almost want to go pick up a copy of Terra Mystica again just because I know it'll like kind of itch the same scratch. But part of me wants to say, well, Jason owns Terra Mystica and I could play his copy and I could just right. pick up Clans later. So, right. Yeah. They're pretty similar. Later. So, right. Yeah. They're pretty similar. Yeah. I I'm trying to think what else we didn't get a chance to play. Um, uh, I kind of actually wanted to play Euphoria a little bit. Oh yeah, me too. Um, and then I brought Viticulture too. So I mean, both of our I games. I love Viticulture. Viticulture is one that I'll always be sad. I didn't get a chance to play it. So That's so good. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. Um, so I did ask everybody what their favorite game was that they played, that I, I played with. My favorite was Dinosaur Island. That was my favorite gaming experience of that day. I just yeah. really loved it. Like, it was new to me. So playing a game for the first time is always really fun. But right. then beyond that, like, I just really enjoy... I just really enjoy the way how the mechanics all fit together, like a puzzle almost. It's really neat. Agreed. My brother Matt said his favorite game of the day was um, Ennis. He liked Ennis the most. Really? Um, yeah, he said it was his favorite game. He said it was kind of neat how the cards kind of break the game each time, or you don't expect the cards to play in the order they do, and it kind of makes things unpredictable. <laughs> he said he's he had two. He said Empire was his favorite game, but he said he had more the most fun playing Revolution. So he, he um, loves those negotiation games. He does. So <laughs> just kind of, well. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my gold, my gold, Jason. I'm dying. <laughs> I can't laugh because I start coughing. This this thing, like, if there's any medical professionals listening to this, they're probably like, "Dude, go to the hospital. You have pneumonia." <laughs> but but uh, his statement before we started playing Revolution was, "If this is another accounting game, I swear <laughs> I will walk." It like was dead serious about it. So he yeah, definitely he loves negotiation games. <laughs> Yeah, I think Katie enjoyed role player quite a bit. Yeah, she liked role player a lot. Yes, for sure. What was what was your favorite experience? I, I'm trying to figure out if you like Dinosaur Island or Mombasa better. I love Dinosaur Island, but it would, probably would have been Mombasa for sure. Yeah, that's a hard one. It's like choosing. It's like being asked, uh, like, I don't know, if you think someone's baby is cute or not, and like the baby really isn't <laughs> that cute. You know, I don't know. So that's right. a hard choice. <laughs> 
That's a bad analogy. I took NyQuil like half an hour ago, so this episode <laughs> might get real fun here in the next few minutes. So, <laughs> anyway, anything else you want to say about what we played, Jason? No, I, I'm good. I think we just need to get together and play more games. Yep. Absolutely. I wish there wasn't 150 miles of geography between us. <laughs> right. So, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed having an episode come out two weeks in a row. Our goal is going to be, and I'm not going to say it's hard and fast going to be the rule, but our goal is going to be to try and put an episode out every week um, and try and have both of us on every episode. Um, that said, I mean, I, I could see where there be, might be an interview or something that happens where the other one's taking a week off, but we're going to try and have something here every week. And uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed recording again in a week. It was kind of fun. Um, good time. I think we're going to look at having, I don't know, Jason, do you want to announce what we're going to do next week or do you want to... Maybe it'll be news to me. You pick. You pick. I don't care. What's our next topic? All right. So let's go with games we are jealous that the other person has that we That's do a not. Good topic. And yeah. I already know. I immediately know like what three I'm going to pick probably. Yeah, I think I could. I could name it too. I there's like you have three games that I'm just like, oh man, that game is sweet. I wish I could find <laughs> a really good sale for it or something. <laughs> right. So. All right. Well, cool, Jason. Thanks for thanks for spending some time here talking with me. And uh, thank you, you audience, for listening. Jason, what's going to be our code word for high fives? Um, let's do Africa, since we talked about Mombasa. Camping, because that's a game about camping. <laughs> In Africa, so Africa still applies. Yeah, it's a uh, African camping trip where <laughs> you're going to have as much fun as possible. That's what those tracks are. Much fun as possible. That's what those tracks are. The amount right. of fun you had. Yeah. All right, Jason, thanks for thanks for talking with us. Thank you for listening out there. This has been the Board Game Mechanics, and I've been Joel. I'm Jason. We'll see you next time. See ya.